Okay, well, welcome uh, eventually to this uh, afternoon session. Uh, I'm John Bryant, uh, as it says up there. Um, I, I've worked uh, in science all my career, uh, mainly with this lovely substance called DNA, of which our genes are made. So DNA is my favourite molecule, uh, and I feel everybody should have a favourite molecule, but that's, certainly that's mine. Um, and, and working with DNA over the years has thrown up some interesting questions in science, but also interesting questions in relation to what does society do with scientific knowledge. Uh, and hence this word bioethics. Uh, bioethics describes the ethical issues that have arisen uh, over, particularly over the last 40 years, uh, and increasingly fast over the last 10 or 15 years uh, in the way that genetic science and similar scientific activities are throwing up uh, ethical questions. So that's bioethics. Uh, and uh, the Higher Education Academy, which looks after university teaching, has decided that uh, this is a good thing for biology students to know. So I've been advising the Higher Education Academy uh, on this topic. So, by way of introduction, it is that question about how science and society should make use of scientific knowledge. How, how should we decide what to do with what uh, is thrown up uh, in scientific research? What do we do with it? How should we use it? Can we use it for the good of humankind? Or are there, are there, the, are there downsides? If there are downsides, how do we decide to control them? And so you see that we begin immediately to run into issues of right and wrong. And issues of right and wrong lie outside the ability of the scientist. That these are issues to do with how individual humans react and how human societies react and about human personalities and human morality. Issues of right and wrong. We can do something. There are lots of things we can now do, uh, which we couldn't do ten years ago. And the question is, should we? Uh, I'm old enough to have seen the original Jurassic Park movie, uh, which was wonderful. Uh, and, and in that particular version of the movie, uh, the character played by Jeff Goldblum, Dr Ian Malcolm, talks to the character played by Richard Attenborough, who's in charge of the dinosaur cloning lab. And he says, basically, your scientists spend so much time thinking about what they could do, they didn't stop to think about whether or not they should do it. Ethics arising from science, albeit in a fictional case there, but we can clone stuff, so that it might arise in reality. Can we clone something? Should we? So, but are there, therefore, you, limits to the use of scientific knowledge? Some of you may have studied in history World War II, uh, and in World War II, one notorious example of this question was the Manhattan Project. Should we use our knowledge about nuclear fission to make weapons of mass destruction? We could, but should we? Einstein and many other physicists believe that we should not do that. But uh, the, the industrial military complex felt that in order to shorten the war, we should do that. So there are questions of right and wrong. But in this particular context, we have another question to ask. Uh, if we have a religious faith, does that give us any sort of priority in making moral decisions in these sorts of areas? Do we have special knowledge? Does a religious faith help us to make decisions about what to do with DNA? Does it help us to make decisions about what to do with nuclear physics? And if we think it does, and in a sense I'm addressing, I'm a practicing Christian, I'm addressing members of my faith community and of all other faith communities. If we believe that our faith has helped us in this area, I'd be very interested to know how we think it has. What exactly was the help we received? How does a religious faith help us to make decisions and why. So I'm going to talk about one, two, how two areas of science have come together to present us with dilemmas which are ongoing. Uh, and, and the first area of science uh, is the area of test tube babies. Uh, and, and you will be aware, I'm sure, that the first test tube baby, so-called, actually the babies are, the fertilisation occurs in a petri dish, not in a test tube. The first test tube baby was born uh, in 1978. So there we go. Um, 
So I've met some very early test tube babies in my time. I've met number eight, <laughs> who's the head of geography at a high school in, in, in Kent. Um, so quite a few uh, of us around. Uh, obviously, I'm a bit old to have been born as a test tube baby, but uh, since about 14 or 15,000 are born in Britain every year now, you can see that there's large numbers of, of babies who've been conceived by IVF. In vitro fertilization, in other words, fertilization occurred in glass, in vitro, in a Petri dish. And here's one of the inventors, uh, Professor Bob Edwards, when he was very old, just before he got his Nobel Prize. Uh, and here he is much younger when uh, Louise Brown was born. And here's Mr. Patrick Steptoe, uh, who was the obstetrician. Uh, Bob was the scientist. Uh, Patrick Steptoe was the obstetrician. The woman in the middle, sadly, is not Mrs. Leslie Brown. It's the nurse that helped with the caesarean section when the baby was born, and Leslie was recovering from the caesarean section. Uh, and, and Bob Edwards was awarded a Nobel Prize about two years before he died, quite a long time after the event, for uh, inventing in vitro fertilisation. And incidentally, his work started off not in a hospital, but in the building next door to where I was doing my PhD in Cambridge, he was working on in vitro fertilization of mice. And we thought he was bonkers. We thought this will never work. Uh, and yet, just 10 years later, uh, baby Louise Brown was born. Now, here's, here's, a, here's a, a funny aside. Mr. Steptoe did not get a Nobel Prize. Why didn't he? Well, he died. And, and the Nobel Committee will not give prizes posthumously, in other words, after somebody's death. So my advice to you budding scientists, and I hope there are many here, several here, is that if you want a Nobel, don't die first. <laughs> Just hang on there, as Bob did. Um, and interestingly, a there was a religious perspective on this, that, that uh, the Pope at that stage, I think it was Pope Benedict, immediately said that the Nobel Prize should not have been given because the technique was inherently evil. Those were his words. And so there's somebody with a religious perspective saying that there were, this, was, this was wrong. It might help many, many couples to have a child, but he felt it was wrong. So there's one half of our, um, of our pair of techniques that I'm going to talk about. But before we move on to the other half, a, a joining topic is that both, both parts of this story involve human embryos in the Petri dish outside of the human body. And, and these pictures, which are not brilliantly clear because of the lighting, these pictures show those early stages. This is from an in vitro fertilisation clinic uh, at St George's Hospital, uh, which is the one that's on 24 hours in A&E uh, on Channel 4. Uh, and this is a newly fertilised human egg. Uh, and and uh, with good lighting, you can see the separate male and female um, nuclei. The two chunks of genetic material, one from mum and one from dad, are, are visible in this picture. And then, uh, normally, this is happening in the fallopian tube. The embryo migrates down towards the womb uh, and divides as it goes. Uh, and, and another thing we need to say about that is that for the first two cell divisions... The two sets of genetic material, his dad's and his mum's, uh, they remain separate. And they don't join into one double set until this stage. So an interesting, you know, they're almost trying each other out. Well, I'm in this cell, says the male stuff. There's this other DNA. Um, shall I get together with it? And eventually it does. Another thing to note is that I talked about new, newly fertilised here, but what actually, that process has taken 10 hours. And, and, and I hear, sometimes hear people say, often people with a religious conviction, they talk about the moment of conception. There is no such thing. The process of fertilisation takes 10 hours. And, and even then, the woman isn't pregnant. The woman isn't pregnant for another five to seven days until the embryo reaches this stage here. And at that stage, if she's going to become pregnant, the embryo will cling on to the wall of the womb uh, and maybe 20 to 30% of those early embryos actually start a pregnancy. So we've got a lot of loss and a lot of kind of fuzzy areas rather than talking about specific events. So there we have the early embryo and we're going to be thinking about the ways we can man manipulate them. If we can manipulate embryos, what does that mean? Are we, are we manipulating human beings? Or are we manipulating just little biological entities? Are they humans or not? And that was the question that the Warnock Committee, 
which the government set up to examine these issues, that was the question the Warnock Committee set out to discuss, amongst many, many other things. How should their process be regulated? Should they be licenses? What about safety? All that sort of stuff. But this was the, a philosophical issue. Are these early embryos, before there's a pregnancy, are they to be regarded as people? And if they're to be regarded as people, then all the ways that we regard other people in terms of right and wrong, good treatment of other human beings, would come into play but what they decided was the early embryo is not yet a person but nevertheless should not be regarded as just a ball of cells. They are balls of cells biologically but they're suggesting that we need to have a little bit more respect for them than we would have for just a ball of cells. The embryo of the human species should be afforded some protection in law. So what that meant was that we don't think that they're people and therefore we might say the ordinary boundaries of moral behaviour don't quite uh, fit here. But nevertheless, we don't make human embryos for casual reasons. We're making them to help subfertile couples. We're making them to study infertility. We're making them to study genetic disease. We're not making them just for the sake of it, just to see what we can do. So you can see there's a bit of ethical tightrope walking that, you know, well, no, not people, but on the other hand, let's, let's have a bit of respect, you know, kind of walking a tightrope between those two positions. Okay, so, so the status of the embryo is the kind of joining point between the two aspects of science that I want to talk about. The other aspect is genetics. Uh, and, and over the years, since about 1990, uh, focus on human genetics has really multiplied and so our knowledge of human genetics has just expanded and expanded and expanded and expanded and so you will be aware that some diseases are inherited uh, they're passed on from generation to generation uh, and that's because the DNA has changed in a process called mutation and we need to remember as, uh, as in if you've heard Bethany's talk that very process of mutation also gives rise to the variety on which uh, evolution can work. It also gives rise to the beautiful variety in the human species that we see before us. Um, the human species is very interesting. That, you know, we, think, we think actually we're very varied, and, and certainly uh, when we look at each other, we are very varied. Uh, I'm very proud as a blue-eyed person to be descended from one single mutant uh, that rose somewhere in southern Europe about 6,000 years ago. We blue-eyed people can be proud of that. <laughs> Well, uh, is anybody here lactose intolerant? No, so we're all mutants in that respect because we are, our lactose tolerant, intolerance gene has been switched off and so we can all drink milk after we've been weaned. So human, human variation. And yet, I could, I could look at your DNA and my DNA and apart from the fact you've got two X chromosomes and I've only, only got one, we would only differ in about one in every thousand bases. The human species is one, uh, and there's no genetic, there's no absolutely no genetic justification for racism. And yet those, that small number of genetic differences gives us a beautiful variety in the human species. But it also gives rise sometimes to human disease. Uh, and I, I'm not going to talk in detail about the diseases, but we can test those early embryos, we can test to see whether they are carrying a genetic disease. So we can take one cell out of a human embryo, or a mouse embryo, or an elephant embryo, and test it. So imagine that we thought that there was a chance that our child might have a human uh, genetic disease that we were in danger of passing on. We might want to go in for IVF and have the embryos tested. And if the embryo uh, was free from the disease, we could use it to start a pregnancy. If it was carried the, the suspect gene, then we wouldn't use it. So we can test human embryos to see whether there's been any change in the DNA coding. And we call that pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Implantation is the process of starting the pregnancy when the, the embryo clings onto the wall of the womb. It's genetic diagnosis, and, and this therefore happens before implantation. And I will call it PGD from now on. And just imagine then that, that you knew, because of the genetic background from which you came, that you were at risk of having a child. You might want to play genetic roulette and just risk it, 
Uh, you might want to play genetic roulette slightly less vigorously uh, and, and to uh, start a pregnancy, but abort if at 12 weeks you showed that the baby was going to be unwell. Or you might decide to go in for this, which some couples find rather less difficult than considering an abortion. And that's another thing that you might think about. We've talked about these embryos as not being people. We think about when does a fetus become a person? Is, is dealing with an embryo easier than dealing with the abortion of a fetus? So I'm going to tell you two stories uh, which relate to this. I'm going to tell you, uh, the, the, these names in this story are made up because uh, in Britain we're very strong on patient anonymity. Uh, and if the couple don't want to divulge their names, then they don't. So I've called the baby Matthew. Uh, and the parents, Helen and Peter. Now, they knew that in their families was this very, very difficult and unpleasant disease called cystic fibrosis, which affects the gut lining and particularly affects the lungs, uh, and in men also affects the vas deferens, the sperm-producing tract. So up until recently, it used to be fatal in the teens or 20s, although medical progress is such that people are now surviving well into their 40s and 50s. But it's still a very unpleasant disease. Those people who do survive are on regular pills, uh, on physiotherapy, have to watch every single cold they get. So Peter and Helen knew that they were both carriers. And what do I mean by that? That each of them had one duff copy of the gene. But this is an illness that we call recessive. In other words, to be ill, they'd have to have two duff copies of the gene. They had one, uh, and they knew that because firstly they'd looked at their family histories and they'd seen the cystic fibrosis coming down through uh, and, and wondered whether they were carriers, and two, because one year earlier the cystic fibrosis gene had been discovered. It'd been discovered in two groups, uh, Francis Collins uh, in the United States and Bob Williamson in London. Uh, the Collins group won the race by a short head. Uh, and Francis Collins, who's a, an active Christian, incidentally, went on to become uh, Barack Obama's director of health. So he's gone quite a long way. So the cystic fibrosis gene had been discovered, which means that they could be tested for it. Any of us could be tested for it. Uh, and, and they showed they both had it. Now, so what, what, what's going to happen? Each embryo that they make, whether in a natural pregnancy or an IVF, has a one in four chance of carrying two copies of the faulty gene. In other words, of being ill. Now they thought those odds were a bit disadvantageous, one in four, and so they elected to go for the process I've just described. They didn't want to have a child with cystic fibrosis, and so they underwent IVF. And I can see that uh, a, bit of, a bit of genetic transposition has occurred here. <laughs> Reverse of the letters would also be a mutation in DNA. That would be disastrous <laughs> if we were reading that as a gene. Uh, and the embryos were tested for CF. Uh, and only embryos free of the mutation were used to start a pregnancy. So baby Matthew was born. I'm just going to give you a few seconds to think about this because time is short. But uh, just talk about that with your neighbour. And I don't think there's anybody here without a neighbour, so you don't have to talk to yourself, as I, I often do. Um, and see whether you're OK with that or not. It's good. It's a good buzz here. <laughs> OK, folks. Let's... let's, let's Anybody want to be brave enough to say what they think, or shall I, shall I, shall I point? There, anyway, at the back there. Um, we think that it's okay for that treatment to happen because there isn't, it isn't worth putting the child through that pain if you know what it's going to go through, so you're better off just getting Okay, so we think it's okay because having a child who's going through all that pain and difficulty is not a good thing, not a morally good thing. Yeah, anybody? As a couple, we think they'd go through less trauma, for example, if they really wanted a child and then thought, OK, well, we won't have one, but then thinking, oh, if we did have one, it might be OK. And then if they did have a child which then had the illness, then having to abort it, and then if it happened again, it would just be so much more complicated rather than just going with IVF. Or bringing it to term and having it as a child to raise. So there's tension for the couple, 
about worrying whether the child has CF. And then there's the difficulties of either having a termination of pregnancy or raising a child with a serious condition which can affect family dynamics. That's very good, very good thinking. Okay, right, let's move on. I, I wonder if it makes any difference to our discussions that we have an all-female group here. That would be very interesting to know, wouldn't it? So the question then arises, in what way is Matthew better than other human beings? Well, he's better because he's healthier. Uh, and the cystic fibrosis gene has not been passed on through that family lineage. But is that morally better? No, he's just, he's just healthier in this respect. Okay, now here's a, here's a similar story. We're talking again about one of these conditions we call recessive, where you need to inherit two copies in order to be ill. Uh, and in this particular case, the parents did not know that they carried one copy of a faulty gene until the first baby was born who was unwell. So this is Molly Nash, her parents Jack and Lisa. We know this because this is a very publicly debated case. The parents were Jewish, are Jewish, and the Jewish populations in America have a high frequency of two mutations that have come all the way from Eastern Europe with them. Uh, and Fanconi anemia is one of them, and an even more difficult disease called Tay-Sachs is another. So here we have Fanconi anemia. Usually causes death in childhood. Interestingly, Lisa Nash as a paediatric nurse, and she recognised the symptoms instantly. The obstetricians uh, and, the, and the, uh, the birth care team didn't. They'd never seen it. Uh, but uh, she had, and she knew how serious it was. Uh, and anemia simply means that we're not producing enough red blood cells, uh, and, and so the production of red blood cells simply fails to keep up with the child's growth. And the child will die, and it depends how serious uh, the condition is, but will die sometime between the age of 8 and maybe 15. Uh, Molly's case turned out to be particularly serious. So we can cure anemias like we can cure leukemia by having a transplant of bone marrow cells, stem cells. We can, and, and you've all heard of bone marrow transplants. You may even know uh, a friend who's had one uh, to deal with childhood leukemia. Uh, it's relatively common now. But you also know that in order for the transplant to work, the donor's got to be compatible with the receiver. And so here we've got a situation where Molly could be cured with an appropriate donation, but there were no compatible donors. That uh, she was the first child, so no siblings. Her parents are going to be 50-50 matches at best. Uh, in the Jewish community in Denver, there were no matches. And there were no matches in the state or national databases. And, and so they could, have an, they could try for another child. But you've got, a, this time, not a one in four chance of getting it wrong, but a one in 16 chance of getting it right. Because you've got to have a child free from Fanconi, but who is also compatible. It's a lot, a lot of children to have uh, with a statistical chance of getting a hit. And so you can imagine what they did. They had IVF and PGD, but the PGD, in this case, rejected some embryos which were not unwell. <laughs> and baby Adam was born. Now, we're very grateful to mammalian physiology here because the umbilical cord and the placenta between them have got some stem cells in them that behave like bone marrow. Uh, and if the receiver is small enough, there's enough there to satisfy their needs. Uh, and so the clinician drains the placenta through the umbilical cord into a receiving vessel under sterile conditions. Uh, and those can be used to infuse into the patient. Now, by the time this happened, by the time Adam was born, uh, Molly was seven or eight and had a very serious form of the illness. Uh, and uh, she, was, she was at death's door. And the clinical team were not at all sure she'd survive. But as they said, she's going to die anyway, so let's try it. Uh, and, and so they went off to the centre in Chicago where all this was happening. Their rabbi went with them. They were from a liberal Jewish synagogue. Their rabbi went with them, uh, and while the transplant was going on, he lit candles outside the sterile suite and prayed with them all night. I imagine they went to sleep at times as well. <laughs> so that was, a, that was a member of the, you know, the faith community supporting this type of activity. Uh, and, and that happened some time ago now. <laughs> 
Adam has cured his sister. Uh, she would have died. She's now 20. So this is 12 years old, and Adam is just approaching his teenage years. I just wonder how he feels about all that. Just have a chat again with your neighbour and see if you can tease out the different threads of thought that might occur in this successful case, or what if it had been unsuccessful?